Make sure you get your orders in so we can get that. Um, get your food out and uh, let's get started. Are you guys ready? I said, are you guys ready? We can network all day, but we do have an agenda, so let's try to get this party started. Is everybody with me? I still hear a lot of talking. <laughs> all right, cool. I think we're good. Uh, my name is Eric Badiwala. Uh, we want to welcome you to the Elevate Commercial uh, Multifamily Meetup. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, this is my partner, George Abreu. Uh, we're going to be uh, tag teaming in this event and talking side by side here. I want to introduce some of our team members. We have uh, John Akocha, who's our VP of Acquisitions. And we have our newest uh, team member, our partner, Carrie Benars, and she is uh, in charge of the director of um, So if you get an email from them or any type of communication from them, um, respond, because they're part of it. <laughs> uh, so what do we got today? Uh, so number one, thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's our first event of 2020. Uh, we wanted to change it up from Bell's Phone Mom. Uh, we thought that, that was a great space, but this space is pretty cool. Uh, actually, my friends own this place, so if you guys, have been, if you guys haven't been here, I heard that the food is pretty good. I haven't been here yet, but we hope you guys enjoy it. So a couple of housekeeping items. If you could please turn off your cell phones. We don't want those going off during the meeting, uh, and interrupting anybody besides you or uh, any of the speakers here. So again, if you haven't, if you didn't hear that, turn off your cell phones. Uh, number two, please pay your own tax. You don't want to be that guy or gal that walks out and, you know, then we're stuck with a tab, I guess, but uh, just make sure to pay your own tab and make sure to get your orders in uh, so we can get things rolling here. Uh, there's a couple things on your, uh, in front of you, if you can look at them. Uh, one of them is a flyer thanking our sponsors. Uh, it's a backsided, so I'm going to talk about our sponsors here in a, in a minute. Um, so we have seven sponsors today, so we want to say thank you to all our sponsors and all of them are going to be uh, talking here in a minute. Uh, on the other side is our latest um, offering, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in Oklahoma City. And then you have your feedback forums on, on the table as well, and we just want to hear your feedback, right? We want to hear what you think of this event, uh, what we can do better, and um, you know what you want to hear, right? Because we're, our plan is to do these every single month, and we want to make sure that we're listening to the people that are attending, right? We don't want to just come up with our own agenda, right? And if we're not delivering value here, then what the heck are we doing? So, uh, you know, uh, we, I think we got into some good networking today, so we're gonna get into the content next. Um, and I think that's all I have for the housekeeping items. Um, oh, bathrooms, if anybody needs to know, is go down that aisle and then take a right, and it's right over there. So, uh, I think the parking, was the parking better here this time? For those of you who have been here? Yeah, okay, cool. So we may, this may be a new spot, we'll see. Uh, and then maybe in the summertime, we'll take it up, who knows. Uh, to the rooftop. So uh, thank you guys again for being here. So uh, what are we going to be talking about today? Um, a few of you know we, we closed a large deal in Houston, Texas. Um, it was 1,275 units. Now a lot of people will tell you, oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can't even believe that we were part of such a, such a massive deal. Uh, you know, we learned that um, there's really only about 50 to 100 groups in the entire country that can pull something off of that size, and we were lucky to, to be a part of it. So, but we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how exactly we did that, right? A lot of people will tell you, hey, well, we got this deal, and they tell you, like, just kind of the high level highlights of it. And that's not what we're here to do today. We're here to tell you exactly what we did step by step. So if you're looking on taking down a deal, your first deal, a 30-second unit deal, a 100-unit deal, or whatever it may be, or a big portfolio deal, you're going to hear exactly how we, how we did it. You're going to hear some funny stuff, you're going to hear some weird stuff, and you're going to hear a bunch of challenges. And we hope that delivers value for you because, I mean, look, we're learning every single day, and it's our first 1,300-unit acquisition, and there's a lot of things that we learned, but we just wanted to be fully transparent with what we did and how we did it. That way, uh, it's very real, right? Uh, and that's really the goal of what today is about. So uh, with no further ado, I want to get up our sponsors here real quick, just to kind of, uh, for them to say a couple words. Uh, let's start out with uh, Rainy King Insurance, and I think JT's going to say a couple words. And just so you know, sponsors, if you can take about two minutes 
because uh, we're on a timeline, just say what you do, uh, who you are, and you know what services you provide. That'd be great. So this is JT. We're going to be turn. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming out and braving the traffic and parking and weather and all that. This is an awesome venue. Thank you for having us. Uh, you outdo yourself at every event, so we appreciate it and uh, love being a part of it. Uh, Raina King is an insurance agency. We are in Denton, Texas. Been there since 1880. Uh, we have been doing multifamily for a little over 33 years. Uh, we are nationwide. However, most of our properties are here in uh, the DFW in Texas. Uh, because we've been doing it so long, there's a good chance that the property you're looking at we're either currently insuring or we have before. So if you are looking at a certain property, let us know what it is. And there's a good chance that we've got a little bit more uh, inside information than, than you can gather. Yeah. Uh, part of what Elevate's going to talk about today is uh, as an investor, you want to get a good group, a good team together, right? In order to make deals uh, flow right. We want to be a part of that team. We can help you out right off the bat, and Aaron's going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, my name is JT Lynch. I'm with Ramey King Insurance. If you have any questions, uh, please come see me afterwards. I'd love, love to help you out and talk to you about it. Yeah, my name is Aaron Kelso, and I'm also with Ramey King Insurance. And like JT says, we want to be a part of y'all's team. So if there's ever a deal that y'all are looking at, y'all are crunching the numbers, and you need an insurance indication, you know, not a formal quote, but what you think you're going to pay, uh, feel free to send us the address of the property and then we can kind of give you our best guess uh, so that you know, y'all have any big surprises down the road. Uh, so if y'all want to come get a card from me or JT, we'll be happy to help you all out. Uh, thanks, Gus. Um, so that's when you take insurance. Uh, Gary with uh, Timmons Consulting Group, where you at? Come on down. It's like the price is right over here. <laughs> Stand here. Um, I'm with uh, Gary Tipp with Virginia Tipp as a Greg. We're an insurance adjusting firm. We work with a lot of owners, a lot of investors on their properties. They generally call us when they get to a point where they have a loss. Most of the time we're uh, 100000 or more. We're involved uh, to come out and work with the owner. The owners uh, generally running a lot of times have problems uh, that they don't realize until they get a brick wall. Anybody read your policy? Anybody take the time to read your policy to your, uh, to your property? Anybody other than me? Nobody? Okay. That's when people read the policy when they have a loss. Okay, I read the policy before the loss. My, my responsibility is to make sure my client, my owner, is well informed and he knows every option that he's entitled to under the policy to get his claim paid what he's entitled to per the policy. I have, a, I have a team that's working with me that is the best in, in the town, the best in Texas, and in the country, in my opinion, uh, between me, Shannon, and Mark, and I estimate. Shannon, stand up. She's the best part of the company. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I uh, uh, I did what you said to so I don't think it's All right. So what I want to do is introduce myself. If you've got any questions that I can help you with on your policy, uh, when you're looking to buy a property and you want to see, hey, do I have enough insurance on this? Let me know and I can let you know. A lot of people are finding out that they have asbestos in their property after they have a fire. And a lot of people don't realize that the federal government says you have to have it inspected to see if there's asbestos. A lot of my policies I'm looking at only have a $25,000 coverage. And they're hitting seventy thousand dollars in a vacant cost. How do you overcome that? See me. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, let the uh, Lance with Energy Surge Solutions. Where you at? There it is. Thanks for coming out today. Energy Surge Solutions. We go out and negotiate energy contracts. It's real simple. Uh, we take we understand the contracts. You don't have to read fourteen pages, and both you don't get in a pickle if you lower your consumption by 20% when you put new lights in and change the dynamics of the contract. You know, you've seen companies do that and they have five percent of the Move that property, sorry. Uh, we also bundle properties. If you've got a smaller property, you don't have very much buying power. So if you've got a 60 or you a 110 unit property, we actually don't bundle you guys together. We negotiate a larger rate. And if we're putting nine to 15 properties together, we can really cut a penny the cost 
off of that portfolio of buyers. So we work primarily with owners, management companies. The management companies we work for, we're their full service to them. So they send us everything from your transfer of ownerships, getting your credit approved. How many of you have to pay a deposit on your electric contract? Market. Most of my providers will waive those. I, I can get those waived most of the time in property. So, Lance McGee, Energy Search Solutions, my business card's on the desk. Feel free to give me a call. Thanks, Lance. Uh, let's get a hey with Quest Trust Company. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do me a favor, sponsor, stay in this area and don't walk anywhere and hold the mic, talk into the mic because our Bluetooth is here and if not, this microphone's going to go crazy. Specialist at Quest Trust Company. We've got a table right over here in the corner, but if you guys are not familiar with Quest, I would definitely recommend give us a call and talk to one of our IRA specialists. Um, we're here to basically help you learn how to self direct your old 401k or IRA into real estate and other privately held assets. So you have a huge opportunity to grow your retirement account through investments that you have full control over where your money is invested. If you guys are looking to passively invest into some of these commercial deals or apartment complexes, Give us a call, Quest can help walk you through the logistics of how that entire process works, and then we'll act as the custodian over your account. Um, if you guys are raising money for deals, having a good relationship with an IRA specialist, such as myself or Juan over there, can be really, really helpful to both you and your investors, no matter which side you're on. I know a lot of you guys work with us, so if you haven't, ask around. We've got a pretty good reputation, and we're local here in Dallas. We have an office up in Addison, where we do free classes every week, a monthly mixer, uh, MCEs, real estate agents, you name it, we probably have a bright color flyer about it on our table. So come see us and you also have business cards. Um, that's it. Just come talk to us. Bye bye. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Caleb with uh, Madison Tyler. Hi, everybody. My name is Caleb and I'm Madison Tyler. We're a commercial title company here in Dallas. We closed over 300 commercial transactions last year. In 2019, just in Texas alone. We have a national company as well, and we work in all 50 states, so you know, most people are looking at Texas, but we're looking at other states as well. We can take care of the U.S. states as well. Um, we have too many people want to talk about title, so you can go talk to me about title, but I'm also a big dollar, so if anybody wants to talk about dollar, you can come find me. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, now we got Brian with Madison Specs.
And uh, those of you that I haven't met, stop by, uh, introduce yourself to me, I would love to, to meet you. And then uh, we'll just help you from the acceptance of your LOI all the way to the closing table. So thanks, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, these aren't just guys that we just called and said, hey, can you sponsor our event? We're actually working with these guys and all of them are great. Um, so consider them if you need them for any of your needs, um, for any of your deals that you may be doing. So let's get started. We're gonna get started in um, our first topic. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover like several sections and then after each section, we're gonna open up for questions because we don't wanna go through the entire thing and then you're gonna have uh, questions. Um, you know, you may forget what you wanted to ask uh, because we're gonna cover a lot of stuff here. Uh, within the next hour. So um, let's do, we're going to start off with a general rundown of the Houston portfolio. Um, George is going to open up with that and then we're going to pick it back, back and forth on di different sections. But our first section is the general rundown of the Houston portfolio. Hello everyone. So um, like Eric said, I'm going to go through the deal in case you're not familiar with it. So it's 1,275 units in Houston, Texas, southwest part of Houston, Texas. Uh, actually, four of the properties were in Southwest, and then there's one that's in Southeast. Um, it came in at a low basis of 59 a door, which for Houston is pretty good. And these properties are Class C properties, true workforce housing, uh, nothing, no dangerous areas, but uh, true C class. None of them were affected from the floods from Harvey, so that was a huge plus. The average rent increase we projected on on this deal was around fifty dollars. Uh, the comps were more around a hundred, but we're being conservative. And then capex total, we're looking at around nine million for the full capex on all five properties. And then as far as when we got under contract and when we closed, so under contract we got it in late June. June 27th to be exact. And then uh, we ended up closing November 15th. So about four and a half months. Um, originally, I believe we were supposed to close more on four months. Yeah, so we had to extend it a couple times, um, but we got it done. And that's the general rundown of the deal. Obviously we're gonna go into more details. I don't know if we need yeah, so I'm gonna to skip to the next section and then we'll open it up for questions. So, you know, how did we get here? How did we close? $90 million deal, 1,275 units. Um, started with networking. So, the past two years, I've been going to 30 plus events and networking through social media, and going to the events. And um, at IMN last year, ran into actually a friend of mine from middle school. We knew we were both in real estate, but we didn't know we were both in multifamily. Um, so when we ran into each other, we got to talking, and the company he was working for, it, they were focusing on portfolios. Big, large deals, they had about 8,500 units uh, under management already. So we got together, we met a couple times, we took the criteria that they were looking for, and um, I think the most important part was we didn't stop there. You know, we took that criteria, the next day I had our team working on finding deals. Uh, I think it took us two weeks to find this deal and present it to them. So uh, we went through the underwriting and whatnot and then um, presented it to them and, and it looked like it was gonna be a good deal. So at that point, we went over and we met his whole team, which was in South Florida. Um, they came over to our office, met our whole team, and the point is we built a good relationship first. We found what they were looking for, and then that's how we got here. Um, so just to add about those things, it's funny because George and I went to high school together, and the guy that we ran into in the high men conference was our friend Michael, and uh, you know, we hadn't seen him in like 15 years. So the point of this section really is that when you're networking, you never know who you're gonna run into, right? And what relationship you're gonna establish. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if every time you met somebody new or somebody you didn't see in 10 years, you did a $100 million deal, your first deal? 
I mean, that was the situation for us. It was insane. Like, we couldn't even believe it, you know? And like, like George said, we flew out to Miami. Their team flew out here. We got to know each other. And then, you know, it wasn't just a meeting at the office, right? We continued to build a relationship with the entire team. We went out for dinner and drinks. Uh, I think we were in South Beach or like Midtown um, and just hung out, right? We got to know the entire team of the other co-GP. Obviously, we knew our friend, right? But we didn't know everybody else. And we just started building that relationship. Dinner, drinks, look, everybody knows when you start drinking, things start flowing, right? So make sure you go out and have a drink with people. Um, it works. <laughs> if they don't drink, I mean, whatever. Then I'm going to show you temple or something. It doesn't matter. But like the point is, is that make time to spend time with people to make sure that you're you're getting that relationship being built. Um, you know, I think really that was the most important thing. Like, you know, I couldn't make that IMN conference that day, but had George not gone, you know, we would have maybe missed out on an opportunity, and we didn't see that, right? But we, we kind of tackle things together as a team, and it's funny because when George is at the meeting, he sends me a selfie, and he's like, "Dude, look who I ran into!" I'm like, "Holy." Like, we haven't seen this guy in like 15 years, but we've lost in touch with him on Facebook, right? So you just never know where you're going to meet somebody, right? So really, that's the point of this section. Uh, I don't know if anybody got any questions on that, but it's pretty simple, right? You know, we, we saw him, we connected, we got, we got through criteria, and then we ran with it, right? Uh, anything else? Question on any of that? No, it seems pretty simple. All right, so... We gotta stay in the line of the camera here. Um, so, you know, how we found the deal and got it under contract, right? We we took that, so basically look, our co-GP had experience on taking down portfolios, right? If George and I said, hey, we're gonna go take down a, a $100 million portfolio, the broker would have laughed at us, right? Like, what experience do you guys have doing this? What's your liquidity? What's your net worth? You know, do you have experience managing this stuff? You know, there was no way we would have had the chance to buy it. Right? So what we did is we partnered with a co-GP that did have that experience, right? But then, you know, it's not like we're not bringing anything to the table, right? We made sure that whatever, you know, obviously having a construction company in-house, being in the real estate business for a long time and already owning apartments, that's how we were going to deliver value, right? So when we sat down at that meeting to meet them, we discussed on what we would do and what they would do and what those defining roles would be. Um, so basically what they did is they gave us a credibility kit, right? They gave us their schedule of real estate, they gave us their realized and unrealized deals, that means deals that have gone full cycle and the deals that haven't, and we put our logos on that schedule of real estate together, and we were on the same page and said, look, we're going to start submitting offers, and if we do that, are you guys okay with putting our name and your name together? Make sure you do that. Don't just put your name on somebody else's logo. And they're going to be like, what the hell are you doing, bro? <laughs> like, they'll probably say it like that. Yeah, we've seen that happen, and it's very disrespectful. It's very unethical. And talk about a way of killing a relationship right off the bat, right? So make sure you get permission to do that. And we did that, right? So now when we present ourselves at Elevate, we're just not Elevate that owns, I don't know, at the time, maybe 250 doors. You know, we're Elevate plus a deep that owns 8,000 doors, right? So that goes a long way. Right, so make sure it's consistent with your co-GP. So we took the criteria, kind of like George said, we started um, looking for deals, and then um, you know we, we actually found this deal off of a broker. Right, we started cold calling brokers. We have we pay for CoStar. We have access to CoStar. Um, you know, if you don't know what CoStar is, CoStar is basically the MLS on steroids for commercial real estate. And we pulled a list of, of brokers, and we just started calling every single broker in Houston. Um, you know, figuring out. Um, you know, taking the criteria that our, our co-GP was looking for and going out there and asking brokers like, hey, do you have anything that meets this, meets this criteria? Um, so once we found that, we were actually lucky. I mean, like George said, it only took about two weeks and they presented to us this portfolio. Literally, the very next day um, that we had that, that we knew about this and we sent it to our co-GP to underwrite the deal, we were in Houston like a couple days later. We didn't waste any time, right? We, we walked all the properties because it's important. Sellers wanna know that the key principles and the people making the decisions are gonna be on the property, right? So that's what we did. We took our entire team there, we walked all five properties, we looked at it, we analyzed it, kinda did all of our due diligence up front as much as we could, and then we said, all right, let's go ahead and submit the LOI, right? Um, you know, so 
During that process, before you submit an NOI, especially for a deal this size, the broker's gonna ask you a million questions, right? The broker's gonna be like, well, what's your experience? You know, have you done this type of deal before? You know, what's your, you know, what's your financing look like? What's your equity look like? Um, you know, are you gonna be able to meet the closing time frame? This, this seller was a group out of China. It was, yeah, China. It was a group out of China, right? There was a language barrier there. You know, so they wanted certain things in certain, and, and they wanted to do things a certain way. So um, we made sure that, you know, we met all those things um, so that, you know, we can make it as smooth as possible. Um, hold on, I got the notes here. I think I'm missing something. I want to make sure I cover everything. Um, oh, gotcha. Yeah, so any notes, so, okay, so like, we had to have several conversations with the broker, right? We've never just, We've never negotiated a hundred million dollar deal. So what do we do? We let our co-GP handle these conversations, right? They know what they're doing. They've done this before. They've raised six hundred and thirty million dollars over the last three years, right? So they talked. And what did we do? Me and George sat on the phone. You shut up and you listen, right? And you learn, and you 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 continue to hear what they're saying. And you know what? If there's something that you know, if there's a place for you to speak and like, you know, say something that maybe somebody said incorrectly, then you speak, right? But you're the unexperienced guy, right? You see so many people saying, oh, well, this is my deal, I'm gonna talk. Yeah, sure. I mean, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot that way, right? You don't know what you're doing, and the broker's gonna know that, right? So we let our co-GPs speak for us, right, on, on behalf of our team, and you know what? It, it, it got us to where we were, right? We actually, we ended up closing the deal and it got us, got the deal locked up for us. So. You know, make sure that you're doing that, right? And all we wanted to do was just sit back, relax, figure out how they structure it and how it is that you deal with a deal of this magnitude. Look, it's not the same as, you know, closing a 100 unit deal. I mean, it kind of is the same, but it's not because it's just a lot more money and there's a lot more things in it and they, they question you a lot more. Um, so anyway, I think that's it for right now. Uh, yeah, just one other thing there is um, making sure you build that rapport with the broker and also the seller. So we, we spoke to the broker a bunch of times and then when we went to Houston, we met with him, we spent a lot of time with him and we requested to speak to the seller. We wanted to speak directly to the seller. So we got that set up and um, made the seller feel comfortable with us as well as the group. Um, and I think that was very important because we actually weren't the highest offer on this deal, but they felt we were credible enough to go to move forward with us instead of the higher offer. Um, yeah, and that's important. Like, look, sometimes track record means a lot, right? Our co GP had an incredible track record, and, you know, um, uh, that's why they went with us, right? But it was through these conversations. And, and I think about that now, like, the current deal we have on a contract with Oklahoma City was the exact same thing. It was a relationship. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but there was a ton of other offers on the table, and they went with us just because they felt comfortable with us, right? Because we're opening up these conversations and dialogue and making feel somebody comfortable, making feel these making these brokers feel comfortable we're gonna get it done. So, any questions on that? Any questions on how we took our, how we met our co-GP, how you know we handled that situation, anything, it doesn't matter. The more questions, the better. If not, I'll continue on. All right, cool. That means we explain ourselves well. All right, so we get the deal under contract, right, and we get an LOI done, right? So, the LOI is signed, um, you know, and now, it's like, okay, well, we gotta figure out how to come up with $500,000 earnest money, right? That's always the biggest thing. How, how are you gonna come up with the money? Um, so, basically, we started, um, and this next session is really how, how we structure the debt and the equity, right? But the first thing, once you get a deal on a contract, is the earnest money, it's $500,000. So, in this particular deal, our code GP said, look, I'm gonna handle the money. Right? I'm gonna handle the money up front and we're gonna make the deposit. So for us, you know, doing such a large deal, we were like, okay, well, this is cool. Like we now we're not at risk with this five hundred thousand dollars, they're gonna be, you know, financially responsible for putting up the five hundred grand. Um, you know, but it's funny and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but later on in the deal, you know, after we got a couple other co GPs in the deal, we ended up having to put up three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of our own money, right? Um, so you never know what's gonna happen in these these deals. What I can tell you about this Houston deal is that it was up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, um, if you think it's gonna go one way today, <laughs> the next day, tomorrow, it's changing. Um, so it's definitely interesting. But so 
our co-GP ended up putting up the, the equity, which was great, and for our, our the, the deposit, uh, and that was, it was a hard day one, was it? No. Yeah, so look, in the DFW market, I mean, it's almost like a no-brainer nowadays that you know if you don't put up day, uh, hard money day one, you're not getting a deal. And I, and, and I don't know how you buy a 90, well, $76 million portfolio and only put up $500,000. It's negotiation, right? And it's making the seller feel comfortable with who they're working with and who they're dealing with. But if you look at it in retrospect, I mean, that's a very small amount of money, of earnest money. It's Houston, and it wasn't even hard day one. You know, so how do you pull that off? Well, you know, you just say, look, this can't get done, but if you want somebody that can take down the entire portfolio and can guarantee, the, and can guarantee that it's gonna close, then go with us, right? And ultimately, the seller did decide to go with us. Um, so, you know, obviously we put up the earnest money and we have, we have to do due diligence and all that stuff, but on this particular deal, we decided to go with, you know, so once you put up the earnest money, you start thinking about, all right, where's all of our equity gonna come from? I think we had a $69 million bridge loan, um, you know, and then the rest of the equity was about $22 million. So we're like, oh man, how are we gonna come up with $22 million? That's like a heck of a lot of money. Um, so, you know, we went with, uh, actually it's funny. So we started reaching out to a ton of different lenders, right? We reached out to Greystone, to Arbor, a ton of uh, a ton of debt brokers, and just trying to see who can get us the highest leverage, right? We wanted the highest leverage because that meant we were gonna be able to raise less equity, right? We don't wanna to have to take the entire load of a $22 million equity raise. I mean, it's a heck of a lot of money. You wanna be focused on finding deals and doing other things in your business, not necessarily raising money if you can. And that's at least how we structure it, right? So at the end of the day, we ended up going with Greystone. And the reason we went with Greystone is that not only did they give us the best terms, but they also introduced us to a co-GP that helped us raise the remaining $22 million. So how cool is that? We're reaching out to a ton of different people and Greystone says, hey, I wanna help you get this thing closed. I wanna introduce you to two guys that can probably bring in 40 to 50% of the equity. And it's like, duh, let's do it. But I know what you're thinking. Oh, I gotta give up the deal. I gotta give up X percentage. Well, do you wanna get it closed or not? <laughs> do you wanna be greedy? This is a team game. And if you don't act as a team, you're gonna fail. Look, some guys can do it on their own. For us, we thought, all right, this is gonna be a team effort. And again, we don't know, we didn't know what we were doing, right? This is the first time we're doing a deal of this size. So we leveraged our co-GP and goes, look guys, this is the way it always goes. You're gonna have to bring in a couple, of and this is just their, the way they did it, and their structure. We're gonna have to bring in a couple of co-GPs to get this done, because this is a heavy lift. $22 million is a lot of money. Um, so anyway, we ended up going with Greystone, which is great, and they introduced us to another co-GP uh, that helped us bring in that equity. Um, Oh, here's just a good tip, and we're actually doing this in Oklahoma City right now. Um, look, whenever you're doing a deal of this size, or just really any deal, there's debt guys everywhere, right? Everybody wants to do the debt, everybody wants to do the loan, right? But if you tell them, look, if you can help me bring the equity, this debt is guaranteed, I mean, you'll get the debt 100%. And I think we did that on this particular deal, right? Because we were kind of searching for the equity and then we got shot down a couple times. And look, it was challenging. We had to reach out to a ton of equity groups, um, well, actually, I'm kind of getting into the next section already, but uh, anyway, uh, we had to re reach out to a ton of equity groups, and some people told us no. Some people told us we were crazy. But then we got, you know, three solid offers, and then we went with 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 one of them. So, um, okay. So, any questions on how we structured the debt? I think we didn't really go into like a ton of detail. Actually, hold on. Debt. Yeah, so debt, the way it was structured, it ended up being 68800000 We got an interest rate of 5.04%, so it was a bridge, bridge state uh, The bridge had a interest only, it's a two year term with two, a two year term with two uh, six month extensions and interest only the whole time, so three years if we exercise the, the extensions. Um, we went with a bridge versus an agency because actually the occupancy was, I don't think we've talked about that, but the occupancy was around 95% between the five properties. So we could have gone agency, um, 
we decided to bring in the bridge to give us that flexibility, where which is going to work out great in this deal because year two, um, between year two and year three, we're going to sell off probably two of the properties, and we're going to take that and we're going to pay off our preferred equity partner, which I guess we'll speak, yeah, we'll speak a little more in depth on that. But um, so that 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 helped us do that. Um, which at that point the, the returns just skyrocketed. And yeah. All right, so I kind of started talking about it already, but uh, I'm gonna talk about like how we structured the equity, right? So basically we had a, 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 a bridge loan from Grace Home for $68.8 million. We had a, essentially $22 million to raise. So we didn't want to do the heavy lift. So what we did is we contacted an equity broker and we said, look, we're gonna give you the exclusive right to find this broker, not to find this broker, to find this money. Right, and they're gonna tell you, look, we have 100% success rate, we've never failed, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's gonna tell you that. If they don't tell you that, something's probably wrong, because <laughs> they all say that, right? So um, we went with, a, with, with an equity broker, and look, at the end of the day, their 100% success rate, it failed. And they were like, oh, well, we can't get it done. And we said, look, we got no time to waste. Like, we're losing time. Like, we were on a timeline, right? We had our due diligence and money going hard and all that stuff. Um, you know, so we just basically told them, like, look, we don't have any time to waste. We're going to start reaching out to our own equity guys. And at that point, they're like, look, obviously we haven't performed, and they're not going to really hold you to that agreement, right? It's an exclusive agreement, but not really. If they're failing, then look, they understand, right? Because, again, it's all about relationships. They want you um, to come to them later on for another deal. And it's actually, we're doing that now with Oklahoma City. They failed on Houston, but we're getting them a shot in Oklahoma City. So um, when, they when they failed, we took it into our own hands to reach out to other equity uh, firms. We literally <laughs> sat down, had a meeting, us and a co-GP, and figured out who anywhere in the United States, actually anywhere worldwide, that does equity, right? Guys that write five plus million dollar checks. Um, and you can find them anywhere, right? You can find them on LinkedIn, you can find them in these networking groups, you can find them at family office meetings, you can find them at, um, you know, any type of event. Of event. They're everywhere, right? So we were compiling a list and basically sent them an executive summary and sent them like basically all the information on the deal and exactly what we were looking for, right? We were looking for $10 million, right? Is what we were looking for um, from, a, from a preferred, well actually we were looking for about 90% of the equity, but we didn't get that. But ultimately we, we were looking for at least a $10 million check. So then that would bring down the load from 22 million to 12 million, right? And then, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but at the end of the day, we ended up having four GPs, and the four uh, co-GPs split up that $12 million. That's a lot better than doing $22 million. So uh, we went down a list of, of equity brokers, um, had calls with a gazillion people. Like literally, we were on the phone every single day, talking with different uh, equity firms, pitching what we were doing, what we were looking for, what our value add plan was, who our team is, why we can get this deal done. You're gonna have to make them feel comfortable, right? You're taking down a massive deal and they want to know that the person that I'm giving this money to or writing a $10 million check knows what they're doing. So um, one of our uh, equity guys showed interest, right? And he was really interested, right? We got a lot of no's and we just kept going. Um, so one guy showed a lot of interest and then our co-GP co actually flew out to Canada to meet them face to face, right? Um, it's funny, we were just at, we were just at uh, NH, and NHC in Orlando, and we might be going to South Africa to beat another uh, uh, big equity check guy, which, I don't know, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we may have to go to South Africa. But hey, wherever the money is, that's where we're going, right? Because these guys that are writing five plus million dollar checks want to meet you in person, and they want to know who I'm writing the check to, right? You can talk to them on the phone, but they got to get the warm and fuzzy feeling from you when you sit down in front of them and say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we're going to do, and this is what our business plan is, and this is how we're going to implement it, and this is how we're going to get your money back. And if they don't feel comfortable with you, they're not going to give you the money. Right, so that's what our co GP did. We didn't get to go to that meeting. Uh, really, it was their relationship. They went out, they met the, 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 the large equity check right around there. And then at the end of that meeting, they had a commitment, right? So they had a commitment for $10 million, and we were like, awesome, fantastic, we got it. Let's get back and let's hustle because we still got to raise, we still got to raise $12 million. Um, so once we, once we secured that preferred equity, um, we went ahead and started raising our, L, our, our LP equity, right? Which is that $12 million. So then at that point, we created an investment summary, just like you know any other deal that you may see with eight, 10% preferred return, 70, 30 split, whatever it is. Um, you know, uh, we hired Dugan to do that. Um, 
created a PPM and then started getting it out to our investor community to start raising uh, the remaining money of what we had to raise on that particular deal. Our responsibility on that particular deal was about $2 million. Um, actually, it may have been a little bit more than that, about $2 million. So we were able to bring $2 million to that deal um, to be able to get it done. Um, any questions on that? And I may be leaving stuff out. John, go ahead. Yeah. What were the terms of the current equity? The terms of the preferred equity. Um, so, eight percent prep with a four percent kicker, and uh, what am I missing here? You had to ask a tough question. <laughs> I don't have the answer. Yeah, our co GP is the one that really focused on that part of it. So, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we'll, John, we'll get to that just so you have it. Um, and look, you know, when we were doing this deal, like we didn't, we didn't know all the answers, right? It's the first time we're doing this, right? Like we have no idea, right? But you just roll with it. And I think people make the mistake like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm gonna sound terrible. Like. Have you ever heard this phrase, like, act like you've been there before, and, like, you're going to get in? Like, think about it when you were young, you are trying to get into, like, a nightclub or something, right? If you're like, oh, I'm never going to get in, I'm never going to get in, yeah, you're never going to get in. But if you have a mentality, like, you know what, I'm going to get in, and somebody's going to let me in, then you're probably going to get in, right? It's all about your mindset, right? So, uh, I can't tell you, it sounds so stupid, but I can't tell you how important that is, right? Um, so... I think that's pretty much it for the equity piece. Um, I'm sure we'll go into some other stuff, but uh, I guess next is due diligence. All right, so due diligence. Um, to me, due diligence was really, really important because like Eric said, our money was not hard during the due diligence period. But at one point in this deal, we had $1 million hard. So everybody was looking at us take care of the due diligence, having the construction company, uh, last thing I want to do is have a huge surprise happen when we have a million dollar card. Um, so we were very, you know, when you think about it, 1,275 units, um, it's a lot of units, but uh, we just multiplied our team. So we had about, yeah, it's it 10 of us there for five days. We walked every single unit. Like I said, I wanted to be very thorough and go through everything. Um, so we got inside every single unit. I had our construction team there. We had, I don't know, maybe like 15 to 20 crews checking out the structural and the different components of the building and concrete and all that good stuff. Um, so after those five days, you know, we knew what it was going to cost. We knew exactly what it was going to cost to fix the deferred maintenance as well as the cosmetic stuff. Uh, one thing I'll mention, you know, as we work with a lot of different investors with the construction company and I see how they do things, um, their due diligence, they spend a lot of time on deferred maintenance, which makes sense. You definitely want to do that. But they kind of leave the cosmetic upgrade part of it um, kind of just to guess later. Um, you know, in my opinion, I want to know exactly what we're going to spend. So I think I said the CapEx is around $9 million. You know, our first scope, rough scope when, after due diligence was right around $9 million. Um, let's see. We used uh, some software to the unit by unit box. That helped a lot. You know, um, putting a spreadsheet together or putting all that data input would be a lot of work, so we, we um, <coughs> Abby Inspector, I believe. I don't know if that's right. But um, I can figure it out and send it to you if you want to know the software. And then, uh, so that was, that was due diligence. And then we jumped into the CapEx budget. So we take all that information from the due diligence and then there was a lot of meetings with the co-GP, with, um, so I don't even think you mentioned that. Our co-GP also has a property management company and they're the ones managing it. So 
meetings with us, our co GPs, and the management to kind of talk about what we're going to do as far as cosmetics and upgrades and putting a real detailed plan. Like, we're going to fix this many units. These are the type of finish shots we're going to do. We're going to add cedar here. We're going to paint brick on this property. We're not going to paint brick on this property. So, very detailed um, to have a uh, exact final scope of work before we even close on the property. And then uh, as soon as we close on the property, we had a pre-construction meeting, went over the same kind of details and just made sure everybody's on the same page and then kicked off the CapEx. Right now we're two months in, about two months in and we've got almost all the roofs done. We started the exterior paint. Uh, we started the about 30 interior units. So we're not wasting any time. I, another thing I see some other groups is they waste a lot of time. You know, the first couple months, they're still trying to figure out since they didn't do this while they were closing on the deal, they're trying to figure out exactly what they're gonna do, which in reality is just uh, hurting your returns, you're not uh, executing your business plan. Yeah. Okay, so this, any questions on due diligence and on the capex? <laughs> Great question. So the value add play on this one is um, the, the rents were below market. Like I mentioned earlier, they were more about $100 below market on average, even though we just did a $50 projection. Um, so one is go in there and we're gonna upgrade about half of the units and get those rent bumps. And then the it was poor property management as well. So we've got a professional team in there, they're cleaning things up, the expenses were too high, um, tenants upset because things weren't getting fixed. So we're kind of cleaning that part up. And between that and the upgrades, that's pretty much it. I mean, no, no major, major structural deferred maintenance. I mean, there's some things, but nothing crazy. Does that answer? Any other questions? How long? Yeah. So we're estimating within six months we're going to be done with the bulk. We'll be done with all of the deferred maintenance, everything on the exterior, and then we'll still be working through the interiors because, like I said, it's 95% occupied. We're not we're not kicking people out to, to remodel the unit. Um, so the interior units will take closer to a year. And I want to say. Walking 1,275 units is not no easy task. You gotta get prepared with electrolytes, Gatorade, and battery packs to charge your phones. Yeah, yeah. It was it was like August, so it was like 110 degrees. But look, no excuses. It's hard work. Oh, well, I don't want to walk 1,210. No, walk them. You gotta walk them. You have to walk every single unit. Like this is your investor's money that is gonna be buying this property and you don't want to walk the units. You have to walk every single one. And as much as we didn't want to walk every single one, we had to. It took. It actually took us five days. Uh, and I think we, we, we started like at 8.30 a.m. Monday and then we didn't finish till like Friday at 3 a.m. So we had a team of 10 people and then, was it 10 total or 20? I can't remember. Anyway, I think we, yeah, I think we had like seven or eight people and then our co-GP had like seven or eight people. So we had an army of people there, right? And I think. Our goal is to knock out between 50 and 100 units a day, or I can't even remember what it was. Probably more than that. Has to be. Um, so it was hard, but like you know, you have to plan all this stuff, right? You, have, we had a conference call with our co-GP and said, all right, what are the things we're going to need? The one of the most important things is the battery packs, right, to charge your phone, because we were using that app, taking pictures of every little thing, and what happens if you run out with your, you know, run out of battery with your cell phone? You're done. It may sound like something stupid, but it was super important. Um, <laughs> I was going to talk about that. So, well, we'll get to that after. I was going to talk about some challenges that we ran into during due diligence, but uh, go ahead. How are you handling the maintenance? If you're here, you're doing it in Houston. So, her question was, how are we handling the maintenance? So, um, maintenance is is day to day property management stuff, right? We have calls every Friday. So, our co GP owns a management company, right? So, they're the property manager. And we have calls every Friday at 10 30. 
um, to go over any management issues, any staffing issues, and all the, it's a, it's a CapEx weekly meeting, right? We have an on-site um, project manager that is managing all of our properties, and then George and I and our team, we visit the properties once a month. Um, you know, so that's how, you know, we manage it. Uh, it's, it's really some maintenance stuff is day-to-day -day basis, and that's our property manager. But our property manager will call us and say, hey, you know, we got a big time, like, you know, I don't know, maybe plumbing issue or plumbing line stock, and they'll call us because they know that we have the contacts, and they come to us to see how quickly we can get somebody out there. Does that answer your question? It does, but I meant to say construction. I meant to say construction. Construction. How do we manage the construction? Uh, yeah, so we, we hired a full-time project manager in Houston, trained them for a couple months uh, before we even closed on the property, and he's in charge of the day-to-day. -day. Then we have weekly meetings, like Eric said, uh, my construction manager here in Dallas goes down, uh, checks on it, and then myself, once a month, I go down and check on it as well. Um, a lot of communication, <laughs> open communication with the property manager I think is important. And um, I think the fact that we have, we're letting the property manager deal with the maintenance and what they should be doing, the work orders, and then we've got the construction company dealing with the CapEx, seems to be a really good fit for all the properties we've done. Anyone else? I mean, yeah, typically one to two percent. Um, you know, obviously we didn't, we weren't anywhere near that on this deal, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> and that would have been a lot of money up front. Um, so yeah, one to two percent. We did get closer to that because of the extensions, but at first it wasn't. Sorry, his question was on what's the industry standard for earnest money, like how much earnest money to put down. It went hard after the due diligence, which uh, I believe we had 45. Yeah, I think 45 days. Nine million. Nine million. So from the, the time you, you met your partner, uh, what these events, and the time you closed, what was the time frame on to execute this deal? Okay, so the question is, uh, from the time we met this pro GP till we actually executed on this deal, how long, how much time went by? Um, that again? No, 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 no. He's asking from when we met the pro GP. So I met, I believe, is in March, um, and then we put this under contract in June. So it felt fast, but I guess it wasn't that fast. <laughs> We spent, like we said, we spent a lot of time building the relationship too before we executed on it. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the first disbursement is going to be this quarter. The, it's operating really well already. Um, so yeah, we're going to be doing sometime in April. challenges now, so I think, but I'll make sure we answer that. What was the biggest lesson? Well, I mean, I can answer that now because we're about to go into the challenge, but the biggest lesson is like, the deal's not closed until it's closed. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I said it, like, things change every single day. One day we thought we had the equity, the next day we didn't have the equity. Then, uh, you know, we had an issue with the lender, or, or, or there was just always something, and like every, and then maybe it was an issue with the co GP, right? And you're all trying to work together as a team to try to take down this massive deal, but you know, um, it's funny. George's got an engineering background. He likes to have things like all the I's dotted, and all the T's dotted. And I'm like, dude, this is a large deal. Like, it's just, we're not gonna, it's just not gonna be that way. Like, so if you have that type of mentality, you probably need to swallow out that, swallow that now, because sometimes you're not gonna know exactly how it's gonna pan out until even maybe a week before closing. <laughs> you know, so is there a lot of pressure? 
100%. You know, I think we had $1.2 million out in, in hard earnest money at the end of it. And yeah, you're kind of sweating bullets. You're like, man, is this really even going to happen? Right? Because so many, like, look, just because you get a commitment from somebody, what if they don't show up with the $10 million and they have closing? It could happen. Right? You know, it could happen. And then what do you do? But you know, you make sure you have a backup plan. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I guess the biggest lesson would be it's not closing until it's closing. Things change every single day. Uh, you know, and you may think you, you have everything lined up, but in reality, you, you really don't. So make sure you have a backup plan um, if you don't, especially for such a large deal, because next thing you know, you lose $1.2 million and you lose your relationship with this broker, and next thing you know, you're not doing deals there. Yeah, continue to build relationships, have the backups, and that way, when something does get thrown at you sideways, you don't sweat it. You've got five other guys that are gonna do it. Um, that's kind of how my mind thinks it is, okay, yeah, things can happen, but if you're prepared, then it's not a big deal. So we're gonna go into like kind of some of the challenges and stuff. Um, you know, it was funny, because we had that $500,000 card at first, well, that was put up, and then after the 45 days due diligence, it went hard, and then, I, I can't remember the exact amounts, but we had to put up like another, once after due diligence, we had to put up like another 350, right? And then we found out that we couldn't close in time, right? It was too busy? Oh. oh, yeah. I don't know. Whatever the numbers were. It was 500, like 250 or 350. Um, but then we had to get another extension because our equity wasn't quite ready yet, right? And then it was like all the co-GPs were kind of looking at each other and saying, well, we don't want to put up any more money. We already put up a ton of money. So then it was our turn to put up the money, right? Um, so, you know, at that point it was kind of a scary thing because we had never put up our own money um, to do a deal of this size and there was so much uncertainty, but we're like, look, you know, we gotta take be the team player and you gotta take risk here, right? So we put up $350,000 of our own money and that really saved the deal from, from had it moving forward because the other co-GPs had already put up their earnest money and they needed another $350,000 to get to that $1.2 million. And the seller's like, look, if you don't give me this money, you're gonna lose all of it. I'm gonna go to the next buyer, right? So we didn't have a choice. So we put up that 350 and then it, it kind of got us over the hump. Uh, and then we were able to get that extension and move forward, which, you know, we ended up closing November 15th. Um, you know, but then you have other issues like, um, and I, don't, I can't remember exactly what the argument was, but Greystone, which was our bridge lender and our prep equity guy, um, there was something that they, weren't agreeing on, you know? Pretty much the, the prep equity cannot look like debt. You know, you, the, the lender only want, they only want to be the, the debt on the deal. So there was wording with our agreement with the prep equity that the lender, so what happened is they actually agreed to it in the beginning. And then I think a week before the closing, they decided not to agree. Uh, so, that was one of those curveballs. Um, they were able to work through it, but yeah. So one of the funniest things about this deal was that our co-GP, uh, man, his their attorney is just a kick in the ass. This guy is the grumpiest old man I've ever met. And he's a deal killer. You get him on the phone and you're like, why, why is this guy talking? Like somebody step in because this guy's gonna kill this deal. Like he's very like, he doesn't even let anybody talk. Right, and he's very like matter of fact, and he doesn't care. And I mean, I don't know. It gets to the point where it's like, look, if somebody's not on the call mediating with this guy, like he's gonna piss off the seller. So you know, we started noticing that that was happening, and we made sure that any calls that the attorney had with the with the seller's attorney, we were on the phone because look, if somebody gets pissed off, or if you rub somebody off the wrong way, you know, that attorney can call the seller and say, hey, look, I can't get the deal done with this guy. You know, like it's just not gonna work out, like or whatever. You know, something could happen, but. Dealing with personality differences is, is, is a huge thing that we had to deal with, um, you know, and, and the attorney was the biggest challenge, and he's on our side. And I'm not sure why our coach GP is a firearm already, but whatever, I don't know. Um, anyway, he's a good attorney, but he's just very bad at communication. Like, you talk to this guy and you're like, I mean, I don't know, he was super mean to me, but he was super nice to Jordan, I don't, I just don't get it. Um, so anyway, that was, that was an interesting part. Um, so, yeah. So, <laughs> this one's pretty funny. Um, we had an, an intern at the time that we did due diligence. <laughs> I'm over there laughing. Um, and uh, 
he came with us to do the due diligence for some experience, and apparently walking the 1200 units made him change his mind on uh, wanting to learn more. But in reality, it just wasn't a good fit. Um, we weren't aligned as far as uh, personality and just overall. So um, yeah, like in the middle of the due diligence, he, he went home. So that was interesting. Um, so while you're walking 1,300 units, you're going to run into some kind of funny stuff, right? You're going to see like all different types of, te types of tenants. This was a C-class property. So we were walking and we're all walking as a group. And out of nowhere, like somebody screams like, oh my God, like what's that or whatever. And there's like this cracked out, I'm not gonna say it, living in the exterior storage closet outside. <laughs> the property manager's like, oh, well, I've seen you here before. And she's like, no, well, my clothes are inside and this is my boyfriend. I'm like, you can't be living in the closet outside of the storage room. You know, so you're gonna see stuff, uh, you may not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a really small closet and uh, it was a sight to see, um, you know, I don't know, it was pretty interesting. So they had to like tame that situation down, but it kind of caught us off guard. We were like, oh man, we got like weird people living in our closets over here. But uh, anyway, you'll see some different stuff. We ran into like a few cat ladies and, uh, that had like 17 cats in an apartment, which is crazy. Um, but anyway, that, that was just kind of funny. Um, you talked about the font, firing the intern. Uh, okay, I think that's all the challenges. I pulled up our operating agreement for Houston and I just kind of wanted to share kind of like how it got broke down. So like I said, there was four co-GPs, right? Um, at the end of the day, one co-GP brought in $2 million, right, of that $12 million equity. The other GP brought in about five and a half million. The other co-GP brought 1.8 million and then we brought 1.8 1, 1 million, right? So. Yeah, so um, what does that look like from like an ownership perspective, right? So I gotta say this, some, there's been some chatter, you know, when you close a, a large deal like this, you have a target on your back, right? People are gonna know because you're gonna hear. And somebody said, oh, well, there's people posting stuff on social media and getting slithers of deals. I wouldn't call 15.2% a slither of a deal, a $100 million deal. That's what our percentage was. Uh, just in case you're wondering, and look, it's full transparency here, right? If anybody wants to look at the operating agreement, we will, but I just had to say that because it's just, it, it, multifamily or any business you're in is a small community, and it's like, oh, well, these clowns are only getting half a percent of the deal. No, not really, pal. Um, so we have 15.2% equity in that deal. Uh, our other GP that brought in the five and a half million had 40%. Uh, one guy had 22, and the other guy had 22. So, um, you know, we just chopped it up, right? We chopped up the deal and we, didn't, we weren't greedy and said, oh no, well we found the deal, we want 50% or some ludicrous situation or some ludicrous request, right? Like you have to work as a team. And would you rather have, you know, 15% of a hundred million dollar deal or like nothing <laughs> for being like stubborn or hard headed, right? So, you know, we were willing to work with our team and just get it to the finish line, right? And now what does this do for us? I mean, we went to that conference last week in Orlando and people were hitting us up saying, hey, we heard you guys close this large deal in Houston, like we wanna sell you deals. So now we're evaluating several different opportunities. So now it's like, man, we just hit a grand slam. Now people are bringing us large portfolio projects. And I mean, I wouldn't doubt it if we get to 10,000 units here in the next couple, like two years. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, but this deal in itself has opened the doors to so many other things. and. Really, it's the reason that we got this other Oklahoma City deal on our contract that's 850 units, right? Just to piggyback on that, so this was our first large deal, like Eric said. So we had to prove ourselves in a sense. So we were okay taking that 15.2%. Um, but now in this, our new deal in OKC that's pretty large as well, you know, it's uh, three co GPs and we've got a third. So we've proven ourselves. Um, all right, so I think we're pretty much done explaining all the everything that we had. We got about huh? oh yeah, yeah. So we got about ten minutes. Does anybody have any questions at all? Comments? Anything on just anything we talked about? Today? This plan is terrible. Good question. So his question was, 
you talked about chopping up the deal. How did you figure out who got what percentage? And it all depends on, on what your responsibility is, right? Who, who found the deal? Who put up earnest money? Um, who took the initial risk? Um, who's doing the property management? Who's doing the due diligence? Um, you know, who's gonna manage, you know, who brought the equity? Who found the debt? So basically it's just, it goes based on responsibility. And then, you know, us within the four co-GPs, we all decided like, okay, well, these are what the percentages add up to, right? So a huge percentage goes to who took the initial risk. Right? So that's kind of how we did that. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? So, well, we found a deal. Um, I'm not sure if there was a. We didn't really break it up like we looked at it more big picture. You know, not okay. You're getting this percentage for finding the deal. Obviously, you're not getting a percentage for just bringing equity, right, dude? Right. Right. So all co all four co GPs did more than just one thing. So it's just more looking at it as a whole. And uh, putting the earnest money was a big thing. Like who's actually has money on the line. So like Eric said, our money, we didn't put money on the line until later on. We actually didn't really get compensated for that because it had already been split up. So. Um, question, so was that valuable what we went through? Did you guys learn something? Yeah. Okay, cool. Like, we just, thanks. we just wanted to be transparent because like, where do you go where somebody tells you exactly what they did and how they did it? Like in real life scenarios, that's exactly what we did. Like, George and I were flying back from Orlando and we had a Google sheet and we were just passing the phone back and forth, writing down bullet points of everything that we went through, right? And I'm sure there's probably a little bit more detail, but I mean, we're trying to cover up as much of it as possible. People are always asking, well, how do I do deals? And what does that look like? And, and what does the process play out like? And that's exactly how it plays out, right? So if you have any questions, if you have any questions about it, you know, feel free to come, you know, talk to us after the meeting. We can talk about it more specifically. And now you know an experienced co GP if you have any deals, you want to bring us. Um, so I guess uh, the last thing we want to talk about is uh, we have a, Oh, gotcha. So, just a couple of announcements. So, Ronnie, Ronnie, where you at? Waving about. So, Ronnie's got a meetup uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, and he's doing that with uh, John Montero and Anton. Uh, so, I, you know, Ronnie's a great guy. He's with this Disrupt Equity, um, you know, and he's an excellent guy. So, if you haven't met him, uh, feel free to um, say hi to him and, and, and attend his event. They always deliver great value at their meeting. Um, Oh. So we have a, uh, there's another, uh, yeah. Okay, so also with Disrupt, um, February 8th in Houston. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that event, but if you go to our website under events, uh, you can see more information on that. It's a conference for multifamily investors. And then we've teamed up with them for the next day, February 9th, we're gonna do a property tour of these properties that we just talked about, the portfolio. And that's gonna be, there's a cost to go to the event on February 8th, which is pretty minimal. And then ours is free on the 9th. So you guys are welcome to do that. So it is 12.55, we wanted to make sure we got, got you out on time. So I just wanna cover this uh, offering that we have. I'm not gonna talk about it in too much detail. We're not here to sell you on anything, but it's this is the deal we have on our contract now It's in Oklahoma City. Uh, um, it is a 506 offering. Um, it's 850 units. This place is like Disney World. If you've never been to Disney World, you really don't know what it's like, but once you get there, you're like, holy cow, man, this place is really nice. Um, so we're excited about it. Uh, the projected returns are on there. We're gonna be uh, pushing this out um, you know, here this week. Um, and if you want any details on that, you can just go to our website and kind of check out some of the info, but we think it's a real uh, good deal. We're gonna own a large piece there, and we have great uh, co-sponsors. Actually, we're, we're sponsoring with the same co-GP that we did in, uh, 
that we that we used in Houston, and then we're also uh, co GP with uh, David Scott with Bell Asset Management. If anybody of you know of him, so under management between the three of us, we actually have a billion dollars under management, and net worth of the two guys is over 150 million. So I mean, we're a real strong team. Uh, two property management companies in house and two construction companies in house. So I just can't see us failing. So it's pretty cool, uh, and we're excited. Um, so that's that. Um, Oh, feedback forms. So you have those feedback forms on your table. If you wouldn't mind filling those out, we would really appreciate it. If we suck today, write it on there. You suck. And your, con yeah, and your content wasn't good, or we hated the place, or whatever, or I got nothing out of this, or you guys are clowns, whatever. We want to know. We'll take the positive, too. <laughs> I like to make fun of ourselves, right? I think we do a good job, but no, I, I'm just you know making fun of it. So. Um, you know, right now, what, what you'd like to see, what you'd like to hear, uh, you know, topics, how the food was, whatever, and, uh, you know, we really appreciate that. So, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, we're going to hang out here to do some additional networking, and uh, I think that's it on mine. Thank you. I'll see you guys. I need to head out. Okay, same here. Nice to meet you. Same here. Thank you, guys. Yes.
Yeah, it's still recording. <laughs> 